Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode two of Working at Woodworking. Today, we're going to talk about expectations. In the last episode, I introduced a program and we just touched on some of the things we need to consider if you're thinking about going from being an amateur woodworker, i.e. one who does this for fun, to becoming a professional woodworker, one who does this for money. So we're going to talk about your expectations, what exactly I mean with the term woodworker or woodworking, and we'll evaluate your level of expertise. So let's start off with expectations. I want you to dream a little bit here. Close your eyes. Think about if money was not an issue. In other words, you could not financially fail at this endeavor. What would you want to do? Again, take the money equation out of it. You have a rich uncle, you have an angel investor who is just going to dump a pile of money into this. What would you want to be doing? Where would you want to be in five years? Does this involve woodworking? So if we use that as a launch pad, we can start to kind of evaluate where we're going with this. Now, if you're thinking about this as a side job and you could care less about angel investors, uh, you just want to make some cash, let's keep going with it. But this should give you some idea of where your future lies, what you want to be doing. So let's talk about what do I mean by woodworking. In no particular order, I'm going to name off some things and briefly talk about the pros and cons of different ways you can make money in woodworking. Everyone probably immediately goes to a custom furniture maker. There are people who make some very good money as a custom furniture maker. They're literally world famous. They've been overnight successes after 30 or 40 years of, of trying. Maybe something that I see almost every day is furniture repair. There's a lot of really good furniture out there. More importantly, there's a lot of furniture out there that has sentimental value to people. Monetarily, the furniture's really not worth that much. But sentimentally, it's worth quite a bit. And people are willing to spend some money to preserve Great Aunt Margie's dining chair that came over on the Conestoga wagon, you know, in the 1840s and so on and so forth. You know, these things are very valuable family heirlooms and people are willing to put some money into repairing, protecting, and passing these on to future generations. Kitchen cabinetry. I think the average kitchen is remodeled it used to be every 14 years. I'm not sure how that has changed, but very often one of our houses sold, the new owners don't like the old kitchen, and they want it changed. There's a, a, a lot of really good uh, cabinet makers out there, not as many as there used to be because a lot of their kitchen cabinets are being built overseas and shipped and then simply assembled. But that's one way that you could make a good living for yourself. Uh, custom cabinetry. You might not want to be doing complete kitchens, 
but somebody will call you up and say, I would really love to have this little niche filled in with a cabinet with maybe a butcher block on top of it, some drawers underneath, maybe an island uh, in the kitchen, things like that. Uh, a lot of times you'll see bookcases, fireplace surrounds, Ingle nooks, these type of things. I refer to that, that as, as kitchen uh, or a custom cabinetry. Uh, finish carpentry. <laughs> if you've um, toured a new home uh, recently, you may or probably more likely were very underwhelmed by the uh, the quality of the trim in, in some pretty expensive homes i mean a quarter million dollars and this is the trim that you're putting into these things i'm not going to necessarily blame the builders on that because there's not that many trim carpenters around anymore at least good trim carpenters and very often the builder gets into a situation where they've got to get the trim installed the trim carpenter he had lined up is running you know, three months behind, and he turns to his lead carpenter. Can you do trim? Now, I've watched him do it, and that's what they end up going with. So it's hard work. It's very physically demanding work, which I'm sure leads into why there's not all that many good trim carpenters anymore, uh, but something to consider. Refinishing kitchens. I have done several jobs where the owners don't want an entirely new kitchen. They're not prepared to drop thirty, forty thousand dollars on a on a, uh, a totally new ki uh, kitchen, but they're just really tired of the way this one works. The finish may be dark and dirty and grungy and like 30 years old the cabinet drawers half of them are broken uh, the hardware is old and dated and sucks and you can go into a kitchen and without a lot of tear out refinish the kitchen repair the drawers replace the hardware uh, hinges are going out and breaking all the time, uh, cleaning all that up, and you can really make a, a very significant difference in a, a kitchen and save the homeowners uh, quite a bit of money. And it's not all that much work for you. Uh, this is uh, uh, something you could definitely give some attention to. Uh, interior trim, same thing. It might be uh, old uh, walnut-stained poplar that was all the rage 30, 40, 50 years ago, but they're looking for something different, not necessarily paint. Um, there's options there. Handyman repair services. This is wide open. Just simple little things. Uh, hanging pictures. Uh, repairing uh, window blinds, um, repairing kitchen doors that are never closed, or they drawers that they can't get open, um, the door in the bathroom closet sticks all the time. They have put in new carpet, and now all of the doors drag on the carpet. They need the door bottoms uh, cut down. Just all kinds of, of simple kind of handyman uh, stuff everybody needs. Oh my gosh, if you can do drywall, you're sitting on a gold mine right there. Nobody repairs drywall anymore. They're all too busy just trying to hang drywall, and it's really, really hard to get somebody to, to repair it. Um, maybe you have a bin for music and luthier work building and repairing musical instruments that's a whole field just within itself maybe you'd like to be an educator a teacher you you have that bend for 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 teaching and sharing knowledge 
You might even remember your shop teacher if you're lucky enough to have had shop. Building prototypes, uh, being a pattern maker. I've had people come to me and they have an idea that they may want to put into production, but they need some prototypes to show some people. Um, you can get into some really interesting work. I won't guarantee that it will be the most profitable work, but hey, you, you, you never know. Uh, arts and crafts. Maybe you're really good at building picture frames or jewelry boxes or little bookshelves and cabinets and and stands and things like that, things that you could load up in a van and take to a uh, arts and craft show and, and sell. Uh, people make their living doing this. They, they spend the uh, uh, late fall, winter, and early spring in a workshop building hundreds and hundreds of pieces, and then they spring the, spend the warmer summer months going all around the country selling them. Um, something to, to, to check into. Um, maybe you want to maybe you want to get into media. Perhaps write a book about woodworking. Maybe write for magazines. Something that has just really taken off over the last decade is YouTube videos. There are a lot of people who are making a very good living producing YouTube videos, many of them involving woodworking. I consume a great deal of YouTube. Um, some of the people I follow are the Wood Whisperer, uh, Tips from a Shipwright, uh, Izzy Swan, Festool USA, Shop Nation, uh, Bourbon Moth Woodworking, Charles Neal, rest in peace, uh, The New Brett Workshop, uh, Paul Sellers, Stumpy Nubs, uh, Phil Lowe, rest in peace, uh, Peter Mallard. There, there's, there's just tons and tons um, of really good content out there. And these guys are making a living producing the content. Some of them are full-time woodworkers who happen to turn the camera on and talk about what they're doing. Others are full-time video producers who do woodworking and show what they're doing and explain what they're doing. Uh, two different ways of, of approaching it. Uh, they both have their, their pluses and minuses. Maybe you just want to become a, become a master of wooden boats, canoes, musical instruments, weaving looms, quill writing pens, you just name it. And if you really dive into and master a certain area, you'll probably find an audience and an audience that's worth, that's willing to, to pay for your expertise. Maybe, just maybe, you will become the next world expert of the glockenspiel. Hey, it could happen. The world needs expert glockenspiel people. So I guess what I'm trying to say here is look for a niche, something that you're, you're good at, something that uh, people will give you money for your expertise. Remember, you can't be everything to everyone. You, sure, you can, you can try to go after every single job that comes your way. And, and honestly, whenever you're starting out, that's very likely what you will do. But pretty soon you're going to figure out that if you have to learn how to do something every single job, it's really going to increase your overall knowledge, but you'll start to figure out you're not being very efficient and you're not really bringing in that much money. When you're starting out, 
you know, you're looking for experience. So this is not a, a, a bad way of, of going about it. So where are you right now? Are you an experienced woodworker? If you're young, just starting to get into the wood uh, workforce, the answer is probably no, not really. Young people have energy and they have enthusiasm. That's something that old people envy <laughs> greatly. So if you're young, don't let the lack of experience stop you. You just need to gain that experience by taking it from someone else. You know, years ago uh, in the U.S. And, and, you know, in Europe, uh, we had apprenticeship programs for just about any, you know, type of, of, of trade. Um, usually a person around 12 or 13 would enter this apprenticeship program. Uh, very often the uh, uh, young man would go and, and, and live with a, 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 a master, you know, cabinet maker, uh, woodworker, and kind of become part of the family. And, you know, this happened in all of the, 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 the highly skilled trades, you know, woodworking, carpentry, uh, cabinet making, stone mason, butcher, baker, candlestick maker. And it was a very efficient way of training that next generation of, of workforce. The, uh, the master was responsible for, for providing a learning environment, you know, teaching those skills, and also reading, writing, and arithmetic skills, because those were things that were necessary, you know, to become... A, a skilled laborer. After typically seven years, the the young apprentice would have gained skills that he was a very valued member of the of the company. Uh, he could produce work that produced money, and at that point, he was would be referred to as a journeyman. And the idea was that very often he would then journey out into the workforce and become an employee of, of someone else, um, you know, work for a company, produce work you know, that produced money, uh, get the job done type thing. After many years of this, the, the journeyman might have the idea that he wants to become a master. And a master doesn't necessarily depict the level of skill involved, but rather the fact that the journeyman has chosen to open up a shop and start to accept apprentices. And all of the duties and responsibilities that that, that, that entails, it, it doesn't really differentiate the skill level. A journeyman who's been working for 40 or 50 years is is probably, well, more skilled than a master who's only been in the trade for, let's say, 20 or 30 years. So uh, that master is the one who is training that next uh, generation. I, I, I love the story about uh, Tay Freak. He is, was a gentleman born in Denmark uh, before World War II, and which World War, World War II pretty much ended the the formal apprenticeship program, um, except maybe for some uh, like carpenters union. I'm I'm not real sure, but anyway, uh, Tay Frigg came to the U.S. in the I believe it was the late fifties. And he was uh, hired by the Rhode Island Institute of Art. And he has some great stories about the, his, his time there. And he was, 
hired to teach these old world ways of of carpentry, of woodworking, of cabinet making. And he's he went on to write a um, a three volume um woodworking really textbook um called uh, uh Tay Fried teaches woodworking and these three books concentrate on 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 basic uh, uh tool use basic joinery techniques uh then construction techniques and and finishing techniques i i highly recommend uh to to buy the set and he he was a great influence on on me but we no longer really have this woodworking uh, apprenticeship program. So what is a young man or a young lady to do? Well, we have a wealth of information right at our thing- fingertips. There are books. There are magazines. Uh, there's the Internet. The one thing that is not that you can't gain from those sources is hands-on time. And that's where something like maybe a trade school would come in. And there's there's a lot of trade schools uh, around the country. Uh, a lot of them are part of, of colleges uh, and universities. Um, the one that comes to mind is the North Bennett uh, Street School in Boston, and there's College of the Redwoods in, in California. They will have six-month, one-year, two-year programs uh, that teach you all of these skills that, in essence, would make you a, a, a journeyman. You, you have enough skills to go out there and, and, and make money for either yourself or someone else. They're not real heavy on the business side of things, but they're very intense on the skill sides of things, which is what they, they should be. Uh, another option uh, for a lot of people, if you don't have, you know, two years to to devote to this, are, are intensive classes. An example I can think of off the top of my head is the Mark Adams School of Woodworking in Franklin, Indiana. You can take a weekend class, a one-day class. Most of his classes are are week-long, and there are six-month and year-long and, and, and various programs that you can build up a, a, a tremendous, you know, repertoire of different skills. There are these types of programs, again, all over the program, uh, all over the, uh, the, the country, rather. Um, local classes. Woodcraft, Rockler have classes uh, available. Uh, there are some professional woodworkers who, who will offer, offer classes uh, in their shops. That's kind of rare because they're so darn busy um, in, in the first place. Um, again, books. I mentioned uh, Tay Frigg, but there are, are, are hundreds of really good woodworking books that you should be diving into anyway. And, oh, shit, we could do an entire podcast just on, on woodworking books. Uh, magazines are okay. I don't think they're as good as they used to be. Uh, Fine Woodworking is still pretty good. I like Shop Notes because they make stuff, you know, woodworking machines, which I really like. Uh, And I like their format. Uh, It's a no-ad format. Um, Keep your eyes open for old woodworking magazines at uh, library book sales, at... um, garage sales, auctions, things like that. If you can get some fine woodworking magazines from the 70s, you've got a gold mine right there. They're, they're just a very different way of, of presenting information. I, I, I really, really appreciate that. Uh, one caveat, any discussion about uh, waterborne finishes, I would probably skip over because that technology has changed so quickly and advancements have been made so 
almost every day, it seems, um, that I think a lot of the old stuff is, is probably obsolete. Uh, YouTube, uh, again, I mentioned some of my favorites earlier. Uh, some of the videos are fantastic. Other ones are not so great, but it won't take you very long to figure out um, who's good and who's, who's not so good. Um, local mentors. Try to find the guy who everyone takes their furniture to. And he's probably an older gentleman or an older lady, and they've been around a block a few times, and go in and offer to sweep their floor while you ask them questions. Um, help them with uh, moving really heavy stuff. Um, they, they'd be greatly appreciative. Uh, join a woodworking club. Any decent size town or city um, has at least one. Um, there are some old crustaceans in every woodworking club that would just absolutely love to share some of their knowledge uh, with a, a young person. So there are a few suggestions if you lack experience or don't have very much experience. And let's now talk about people who have experience, who have been doing this for a while, who know which end of the chisel to hold. What do you need to do to launch your woodworking business? I would suggest that you start where the inexperienced person does. Uh, keep reading, keep learning. You might skip the two-year trade school, but... Man, honestly, wow, what an experience. The thing about woodworking is that we never stop learning. You know, the technology changes, uh, finishing technology is always changing, particular, particularly with the, uh, the waterborne uh, products. Uh, tools are changing. You know, something that used to take you 45 minutes to do, you can literally purchase a new tool and cut that down to six minutes. So um, we're always learning. But since you do have experience and you think that you could actually just launch into this tomorrow, um, you're in a little different uh, position. Uh, for some of our younger uh, listeners, who have gained that experience, uh, this is where we need to start really putting the uh, pencil to paper and develop a game plan. Probably the first one, are you going to do this full-time or are you going to do this part-time? Part-time makes a lot of sense. You can kind of get your feet wet here. You can keep that 9-to-5 job, uh, keep that, that security, keep that paycheck coming in, keep that that cash flow going. In fact, you could even set a goal that I'm going to work on the the woodworking business part time and keep my my day job for one year and funnel some of the money from the day job to you know support and build up the the part time job. Maybe it's two years. Everyone's a little different. Maybe you're ready to do this full-time. Perhaps you're retired and you have time on your hands and you're driving your wife nuts. You need something to do and you're tired of playing golf all the time. You're ready to go. <coughs> ah. <coughs> hmm. So you need to figure out what you need to do to the garage to turn it into a full-time workshop. Maybe that's moving the cars out into the driveway. Again, we mentioned last episode about knowing the covenants in your particular neighborhood. There are some places that you're not allowed to do that, so that could be a real bummer for you then you're looking for, you know, shop space that you can rent. Maybe you want to do this in the basement. Maybe you have an outbuilding that could be 
convert it into to a workshop. So really start to narrow down on what do I need. And we will go into these things in a lot more detail in, in future podcasts. But these are things you need to just start brainstorming about. Uh, tools. What tools do you have? What tools do you think you will need? Don't get real hung up on what you don't have because tools can be purchased. Don't let that really stop you from from moving forward. Just kind of, you know, take note of that, that you're going to need this, you're going to need that, and then keep moving forward uh, with the uh, with the program. And I think the thing that you really need to s- figure out is your niche. What do you want to do? Do you want to get into trim carpentry? Do you want to get into custom cabinetry? Maybe kind of do the home repair, handyman, woodworking type thing. Start really narrowing down. And when I got into this, I don't want to say that I I fell into it, but just as I was really starting to think about pulling the trigger, I had a neighbor who asked if I could build an X. And, yeah, sure, I could do that. And I took that job on. I needed to buy some tools to do that job. But that job led to another job. And here's a little marketing secret. I was going to save it for the marketing podcast. But guys or gals who are married, your spouse may be the very best marketing director you could ever hire. My wife worked in a um, uh, a business office, basically, and lots of people there. She would just kind of casually mention that I quit my one job and I was starting to do X. She came home with like four names of people that I needed to call who said that they, you know, could use my services. So it it literally just kind of took off from the the very uh, very beginning. And and also, I had a mentor who kind of coached me off the ledge, so to speak. I had these great grandiose ideas of how to write a business plan and and talk to the financing, uh, get the bank loans set up and and all this this high-level stuff. And he kind of talked me down off the ledge and said, no, you need 20 customers, 20 people that over the course of the years will provide you your income. You don't need 200. You don't need 2,000. Now, we were doing, at that time, we were doing, you know, custom cabinetry, uh, build-ins, uh, some home repair, that type of thing. And he said, but you, you, you don't need a lot of people. You, 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 you need a couple dozen. And he said, they can provide you work for probably as long as you want to do this. And he was, he was very true. Uh, very, very correct, uh, because the people that you work for know people, and people like to share wonderful work that's been done for them, and it is, it's a snowball effect. So don't get real hung up on, on exactly that niche that you're going for. If you start throwing out some feelers, that niche may come to you. Um, and the last thing I, I want to mention is cash flow. Uh, depending on your level of savings, where you're at, what you're doing, do you have the cash to do this? You know, if you're a single guy living in your van, <laughs> you don't need no cash. I mean, just start, you know, start doing this. Um, go down to the local pawn shop, pick up some basic tools. There are people who can use your services. So don't get real. I guess what I'm trying to say is is don't go don't go overboard with the planning. 
and let it become the job. You know, I suffer from from paralysis uh, or <clears throat> I suffer from paralysis by analysis and I'll sit and think about something over and over and over and over and it, that leads right into procrastination and then three months later you haven't done anything with this. Please, 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 please don't do that. Just keep kind of moving forward. And this is probably another good time. Uh, this is probably a good time for me to also mention that we're going to start talking about a lot of different things coming together all at once. And they all kind of become interdependent and related to each other. And when we approach a problem like this, we approach it in a linear fashion. We have a beginning and we have an, an end goal and we go in a straight line between that. But what we're going to get into in the next uh, a few podcasts, I, I want to, you to think about this more in a circular fashion because some of the things that we're going to, to talk about is uh, in the next podcast, we're going to talk about uh, choosing a name for your business and, and how that will affect your internet presence and that will affect your marketing and your advertising and how people perceive your business. And if you make one little change to the name, all these other things change. So it would be easy to kind of get overwhelmed at this point. But I, I just want you want to encourage you to kind of keep an open mind and, and just kind of let things flow, you know, as if you're kind of in a whirlpool and it's just going around and around and around and you're seeing how this interrelates to that, so on and so forth. Okay, I'm talking too much. Uh, but, in, oh, okay, I've got two el elderly... Oh, I have two... Elderly people walking up the driveway holding some type of a little table. Ah, that's my 4 o'clock. Uh, they're a bit early, so I probably better go. And we will talk to you very soon. Okay, I know that this is a lot to think about here. And it's very easy to get overwhelmed. You can't make all these decisions at once. Uh, keep in mind that wherever you start is probably where you're not going to end up. You know, things are always changing. So the important thing is to start. Don't wait until it's a perfect time to start. Just start. If you've been anguishing over whether to buy a table saw or a band saw, you're missing the point. The question really is not whether you get the table saw or the band saw. The question is which do you buy first, the table saw or the band saw? And that's easy to answer. It's the one that you need now. Then the other one can follow. So... Before you start carving your plans in genuine mahogany, there are some things I'd like you to consider, namely the name of your business and its internet presence. We'll go into that more next week, and we're also going to enter... For now, you have a lot to think about. So pull out a piece of paper and start jotting some things down. We're entering what I call the whirlpool phase of the process. Uh, think of a of a river. You know, you've you've jumped in the river of do I want to and how do I start a woodworking business? And you're floating down the river, and you've got to think about this and think about this, just as you're passing different landmarks in the river. But now we're coming into this little bit of a whirlpool where things are all going to start to flow together.
and a decision made on one thing is going to affect decisions made on other things, and it's going to get really kind of confusing and maybe overwhelming and exciting and a little terrifying. Um, so just this is getting to the real fun part, and don't get overwhelmed. Stick with it, and oh, I have two elderly people walking up the driveway carrying a small table. That's my four o'clock. Um, they're early. Okay, I better go, and we'll talk to you next time.